morning, good afternoon, good evening to some of you. Uh, my name is Stephen Kluss. I'm the president of the European Union Chamber of Commerce in Canada. Uh, we are happy to have all of you join us today on the, uh, let's say, uh, webinar celebration of the uh, third anniversary of the inception of the CETA free trade agreement between the European Union and Canada. Um, we'd like to get started uh, right away. We have a great panel for you today. Um, I would like to introduce a presentation from Canadian Minister of Small Business, Expert Promotion and International Trade, Mary Ng. Thank you. Hello everyone, bonjour à toutes et tous. I would like to thank Stéphane, Delphine, and Monsieur Bergmuller and Couture for inviting me to join you today. As the voice of European businesses in Canada for more than 25 years, the EU Canada Chamber of Commerce, or UCAN, is a valuable ally and friend, helping our businesses in both regions grow and to succeed in the global marketplace. I know that the past few months have not been easy for our business owners and entrepreneurs, especially those who are exporting. Global supply chains are under significant pressure, and we have seen that over-reliance on a single supplier or customer is a critical risk to our businesses and our economy. Canada is a trading nation, and diversification has to be a part of our solution to helping businesses rebuild and to grow. Free trade agreements, such as the Canada-European Union Comprehensive and Economic Trade Agreement, otherwise known as CETA, are instrumental to our trade and diversification strategy. Canada and Europe have a special relationship rooted in our strong economic partnership and deepened by our people-to-people -people ties. While the world has changed significantly in the last few months, the EU remains one of Canada's most valued trading partners and friends. The EU is Canada's second largest trading partner. Nearly $165 billion in goods and services flowed between, bus, between us last year. And since the CETA came into effect, Canada-EU merchandise trade has increased annually over 21%. Last year, Canada imported more than $92 billion in European goods and services, while 8.4% of Canada's global goods exports and 165 of our global services exports went to the EU. This economic partnership will continue to play a key role in providing opportunities and stability for our businesses, especially on the road to economic recovery from COVID-19. For businesses like British Columbia's Steamworks Brewing Company, the elimination of tariffs on beer through CETA has helped them grow their sales in Germany, Austria, Switzerland, and Italy. For businesses like Ontario's Hudson Boat Works, who sells elite racing shells, exporting is a big part of the company's strategy, and CETA allows them to be more competitive in European markets by removing unnecessary tariffs and export costs. And for Quebec-based business, Rackham, who specializes in solar thermal solutions and clean tech, through CETA and because of Europe's clean energy regulations, it is now easier for Rackham to do business in many European nations, especially in Spain. It is with the help of organizations such as UCAN that our own trade commissioner service that these businesses have been able to grow abroad. And we hope to work with everyone and even more businesses to help them scale up and to access these new markets right in the EU. As Canada and the EU take gradual steps to rebuild our economies and support people across our countries, we know that trade and the opportunities it creates will be crucial. To our resilient and innovative business owners and entrepreneurs, I encourage you to harness these opportunities and customers available to you in the European market thanks to the preferential access created by CETA. I am confident that today's discussions will help you as you work towards economic recovery and will prepare you to do business in one of the world's most dynamic markets. Know that our government will continue to be there with you every step of the way. Thank you, merci.
Good morning or good afternoon, everyone. I'm Delphina Donoso. I'm the executive director of uh, UCAN. Before I introduce our next panelist, I would like to inform you that the Q&A session will be at the end of all presentation. So feel free to type your question in the Q&A chat box at the bottom of your screen. I also invite you to use the speaker view so you can view all our panelists today. So our first panelist today is Christian Bugsmuller. He's a career EU diplomat and has held posts in both in Brussels and at EU delegation in Washington DC and Brasilia. Dr. Bugsmuller served in the cabinet of Cecilia Malmström, former EU trade commissioner, and was part of trade negotiation with Canada, US, Japan, Australia, New Zealand. He arrived in Canada a few weeks back at the delegation of the EU to Canada as chargé d'affaires. A warm welcome to you. Our second panelist today, Chris, Chris Kuta, joined External Affairs and International Trade uh, Canada in 1990. He served abroad as political officer in the Canadian High Commissions to India and Kenya, and as High Commissioner to Nigeria. Most recently, he finished in 2019 his assignment as Ambassador to Turkey. At headquarters, he served, among others, as Director of the Policy Planning Division and of the Southeast Europe Division. Since October 2019, he is the head of mission of the mission to Canada to the EU. Thank you very much to both of you for being with us today. And let's start our conversation around CETA. So over to you, Stefan, for the first question. Yes, thank you. Um, so our first question, uh, I guess I would like to, to ask Mr. Bertzmiel first. Uh, um, Yesterday marked the third anniversary of the provisional entry into force of the Comprehensive Economic and Free Trade, uh, Trade Agreement between the EU and Canada. Um, up until the COVID lockdown, trade was on the upswing on both sides of the Atlantic, and quite impressively so. Uh, figures show that companies were back in the game as of June. Could you comment on the take-up of the agreement in the EU and Canada as a result of Three years of trade liberalization. Okay, uh, Stephen, uh, thank you very much for hosting me uh, today, for making me part of uh, this celebration. I also uh, am very delighted to be here together with uh, Chris Cooter, uh, who is currently uh, my opposite number in, in Brussels and who very graciously hosted me uh, before my, my departure uh, to Ottawa. Uh, the important thing, as always, I mean, Chris and I have not only nearly the same name, but we, we have the same mission to make uh, the EU-Canada, Canada-EU friendship uh, stronger, deeper, and uh, CETA is just uh, one of the great tools in our, in our toolbox to, uh, to make that happen. Um, the issue is that um, I could give you many, many numbers. I mean, this is about the, the question that could end with death uh, by numbers. I just want to give you uh, three numbers uh, on, on the overall trade uh, between the EU and, and Canada uh, uh, has been up by, by 24% uh, when we compare it to, uh, to three years ago. Our exports to Canada have increased by around 27% uh, and our imports from Canada have increased by 47%. So I think that those are very, very healthy numbers. Uh, they show that uh, businesses on both sides uh, of the Atlantic make good use uh, of, uh, of CETA. I think what is important, uh, it's not only about exports. Uh, as is often assumed, how much more can we now export uh, to Canada or for Canadians to ask how much more can we now export to the EU? Uh, imports are important in our interconnected world today. Uh, you very often need imports in order to, to export. So uh, I think both uh, these elements are uh, very important. So we have a good uptake there. Um, uh, I think, first of all, uh, operators on both sides appreciate the fact that now on around 98% of all products, you don't have uh, to pay uh, tariffs anymore. 
uh, but many operators, I sometimes think, uh, appreciate even more that with with CETA we have cut uh, a lot of red tape and made procedures easier, and that is particularly interesting for for small and medium sized uh, enterprises who are often sort of kept out of a market uh, by difficult procedures because they can't afford to have a whole legal department to work uh, to work on uh, these issues. So we are generally uh, very happy with how uh, CETA has evolved over those three years. We should not get distracted by the, by the general Trump, uh, slump in trade uh, we had this year, 2020, because this is a slump we had with every country uh, in the world. I mean, this is the COVID slump. But uh, to us, CETA has lived up uh, to, uh, to its expectations. Um, I could now give you many numbers and go into what it means for uh, mechanical products, for chemical products, for beef and cheese, but I think this is not uh, the idea. Uh, nobody is going to retain that. You find it all on uh, the internet. The main message is trade is up, businesses use it, and there's still a lot of mileage in the agreement, but I think we, we come to that later. Um, Mr. Kruder, would you uh, be able to comment on the same uh, subject? I would love to, but uh, first let me thank you, Ken, and um, wish Sita a happy birthday. Um, I also wanted to uh, take the, this moment to actually thank, since we are using this as a celebration of an anniversary, thank all those who contributed to putting the agreement in place and those who worked both in the private sector and public sector to implement it. And I, I would share with Christiane uh, the view that this is a success. Um, it is a, a growing success. And I think what's striking about COVID, so I'll just add a little bit maybe to what Christiane has said, what's striking about COVID is that uh, one of your colleagues in another CETA uh, anniversary event yesterday mentioned that globally trade is down 12%. And indeed, all of our economies have suffered huge human cost, huge economic cost. Uh, and yet, uh, what is perhaps more remarkable with regard to uh, Canada EU trade or under CETA is that while Canadian trade has dropped over 16%, uh, not surprising given all of the shutdowns and uh, the US border and so on, it's only dropped 7% with the EU. And uh, as of June, uh, the, the uh, I think EDC, our Export uh, Development Corporation, surveyed business and it found that in general the mood was very pessimistic about exporting generally, but not so in regards to the European Union. So I think that's quite telling. Um, I think that uh, in this time of, of COVID, uh, people are looking for more stability, more certainty, and that's what you get both in both directions. Um, that's a trend that we saw even before COVID struck. Um, I think that its relevance at this time is augmented by what we saw in President von der Leyen's speech on the State of the Union last week. Uh, the, the themes that she talked about, and I actually suspect that our Prime Minister will talk about in his uh, or her, the government speech from the throne this week, will be quite aligned, I believe, uh, an in inclusive green recovery facilitated by digital tra transition. We'll probably see topics like that. I think that CETA actually supports those priorities. So it remains very, very relevant to um, uh, our recovery from, from CETA. I also won't go through the, the figures because I think we've, we've, we've heard them. Uh, just to say that interestingly, even though we don't have uh, the investment chapter in place yet, uh, I believe the atmosphere that's been created by CETA has contributed to a growth in confidence in investing in each other. And there we actually have a very nice balance. Uh, we've reached a, about three, over 300 billion in each of the EU and, and in Canada. I know we'll hear more about that later. But again, uh, if you look at the last three, four years, it's been, I think, um, a great success. Um, obviously it's, what's it due to? Well, the 98%, as, as Christina said, 98% of the tariffs are gone. And you see a, a direct line between where the tariff was higher and where it's dropped and those products that were affected by the tariff have increased significantly, significantly more than 40% in fact. 
Um, I think as well, when CETA was being conceived of, um, people understood that there was going to there were going to be questions around sustainability, around gender, around labor, and the agreement was actually designed in a way to deal with that, to ch channel those concerns. And I think, therefore, its support uh, and rather popularity even uh, has been uh, benefited from that. Um, we have, for example, the Civil Society Forum, the last one took place in November. So it remains um, an agreement, a framework that, that brings people in. It's not simply a done deal. Uh, interestingly, uh, as you know, we have 19 dialogues under uh, CETA and we have uh, the Associated Strategic Partnership Agreement, which has a whole series of other uh, uh, complementary dialogues. Uh, prior to COVID, we were discussing with the EU, can we really maintain this architecture? It's quite heavy um, and it involves transatlantic flights and a lot of different departments and, uh, and dimensions. Um, and we had actually proposed going to a more virtual platform. And then COVID struck and all of a sudden we had no choice. And uh, it's certainly been my experience that we have actually in some ways done better by using virtual platforms. Meetings tend to be held when they're supposed to be held. Uh, we've had a lot of ministers, a lot of uh, deputy ministers and other senior figures uh, engaged. Uh, and so we've actually adapted to COVID quite well. And I don't think we'll go back. We will, of course, love to be able to meet everyone in person again. But I think we've actually learned how the technology can benefit us. So that's good for the architecture. Overall, I would say that there's a greater awareness among business uh, of, of CETA. And at the same time, let's be frank, there's a certain, um, that's, a, that's a pull factor, but there's been a push factor in that some of the other markets, uh, and you can guess what they are, are more difficult for a business to access. So we're profiting in a sense from that. Uh, the nature of the trade, and we come to that a little bit later, but the nature of the trade is also quite resilient. It's not simply raw materials. It's not simply uh, uh, manufactured goods or services. It's all three and across a broad spectrum. So I think if one is down a little bit, another one is up. So we've got a kind of a, a resilience that's, that's developed. More and more jobs are connected to, to CETA, as well as, uh, CETA as well as businesses. Uh, the EU site talks about 14,000 jobs per 1 billion in exports. That's getting you over 800,000 jobs. We probably have something similar on the Canadian side. And then the health crisis itself is actually giving us something to work on because quite a few Canadian companies, uh, or sorry, EU companies, have actually benefited under our um, research facility for COVID nine of the 99 that we we funded under a 54 million dollar facility so that represents a new area of opportunity in the health sector and it builds on our mutual capacities in uh, science and technology so i think um you know CETA in covid can remain relevant as we emerge from covid it will continue to be relevant we've not just got a foundation but we've got building blocks uh, in the architecture of CETA that allow us to shape the, the arrangement uh, to support the private sector and to support government priorities such as we've seen in the uh, State of the Union or what I expect we will see in the speech from the throne. So maybe I'll leave it at that. Before we move to the next question, Christian, would you like to add anything on that question? We have other questions, so we have time to... Sure. <laughs> Okay, great. No, it, it, it's good to it's good to to see in, indeed. I mean, CETA is is one of the most uh, comprehensive agreements, and uh, we can really see that it's stable, and it, and it's a good thing that uh, even in figures, uh, this stability between uh, be, between the two zones uh, is really uh, is really showing. So now, if we move to to the second question uh, for you, Ambassador Kuta, even though I know the uh, Mary Ang Minister gave us some example, but uh, can you give us other example of where Canadians company have been actually able to reap the benefits of uh, CETA during the the first two years, and in which sectors mm -hmm. um, in which sectors Canada is, is well equipped to expand to the to the EU market? Mm -hmm. Well, um, the minister stole my thunder a little bit there and gave some really good examples uh, of the range of companies that have benefited so far. And I think I just um, underscore that point again. Um, one of the things that isn't perhaps well known in, uh, in the EU, and in fact, it's, uh, it's a problem that I've encountered in other postings in other parts of the world, is that 
the view of Canada tends to be a little bit skewed. It's, it's a big resource country, everybody knows that. Um, but what a lot of people don't know is that we have this broad range of capacities. Um, everything from culture, we have a huge film industry, for example, um, to AI, we're number three in AI startups in the world after China and the US. Um, and all across, uh, across the, in each province as well, is quite distinct. So what's interesting about um, the developments under CETA uh, is that it has been a very healthy and broad-based development of trade. So it's, as I said earlier, it's included resources, manufactured goods and services. To give us some examples, um, the biggest exports for us have been automotive, um, or vehicles and parts, aluminum and uh, associated products, plastics, and a range of services. And then geographically speaking, the um, distribution into the EU has also been quite broad. So uh, now our, our figures have to probably be adjusted a little bit in the next few months to take into account Brexit, but um, the largest uh, growth markets for us have been Germany, Ireland, Netherlands, Latvia, and Italy. So not concentrated in one part or another, quite spread across uh, the EU, which is also again very healthy. Uh, and the same applies in Canada. The benefits to, uh, to Canada have also been quite broad. Uh, nine of the 13 provinces and territories have seen uh, an increase in exports. And the lead has actually been the province of Newfoundland and Labrador, which has doubled its exports. So that's very good. For, for Canadian uh, business, it, it shows that it's relevant and, uh, and continues to be relevant. Um, you heard a lot of great examples uh, from the minister. I'll mention maybe a couple of others just to give a sense of this is, um, you know, not something that's just good for Canada, but good for e the EU as well. Uh, Quartz Co. This is a company based in Quebec. It was subject to a 13% tariff on uh, luxury outerwear, so high-end parkas, that kind of thing. Um, with the elimination of that tariff, uh, the EU is now its top market. It has two new factories in Quebec and is uh, exporting and, and doing uh, very nicely. Creative Education of Canada. This is a high-end uh, children's costume and party uh, company. Uh, it was held back by a 12% tariff. Uh, that's gone with CETA and now it has a new Hamburg uh, warehouse. It has a new EU subsidiary, also doing very well. Um, Hexoskin, it's a maker of smart shirts. It uses Italian fabrics that are enhanced with health sensors that allows hospitals to monitor patients at home safely, um, also doing very well in the, uh, in the EU market. Um, having said all that, uh, I think we would still like to see greater uptake by Canadian companies, especially the smaller ones. Uh, and that was a focus of the 2018 Joint Committee, that's our ministerial committee, uh, that recommendation. Um, uh, was published in uh, the, the reply to that recommendation was published uh, a few weeks ago in July and includes a look ahead work plan which has a focus very much on e-commerce because that's another dimension which I didn't uh, yet mention regarding COVID and how we respond. E-commerce of course has grown as it has in the EU greatly for our businesses. Um, it's gone from around 5.7 percent of business to around 10 percent of our business is now e-commerce. So we're going to be looking at that and uh, hopefully we'll see more Canadian SMEs enter into the, into the EU market. In terms of the sectors that have potential, um, uh, we continue to have strong uh, trade in, in agriculture uh, in many areas and there's a lot of scope for an increase there as well as in fisheries. Um, we're disappointed that some of the trade fairs this year of course couldn't be held. So um, unfortunately you won't get to taste our lobsters but um, at least not at the trade fair, but uh, we see a lot of scope there. There's a lot of scope as well for um, resources like the minerals that we produce. And we produce a lot of minerals. We produce the minerals that you're familiar with, but we also produce increasingly those minerals that are going to be vital for batteries uh, as you transition into a, into a green economy. We produce 14 of the 19 critical, uh, critical minerals for, for batteries. So that's got a lot of scope. Um, then the other sectors that are newer, the emerging sectors, so clean tech, and I'll talk about that a little bit later perhaps, uh, AI, space, remote sensing, and as I said, uh, culture in the film industry. There's a lot of diversity and um, it's important that uh, we encourage all of the Canadian sectors to take a look at Europe and um, see where they can find a home. At the end of the day, of course, we're the government, we're not great at 
picking uh, winners. Um, and really our job is to make that enabling environment uh, kind of a framework, for example, to assist SMEs. There's a new initiative with Spotify, which is our new biggest company in Canada. Spotify is kind of the Amazon for retailers. Um, but there's an initiative there to support SMEs to get out and do e-commerce. So hopefully those kinds of things will facilitate um, uh, more engagement and, uh, and see more Canadian companies um, doing well in Europe. I see. Um, uh, we'll, uh, I would like to uh, say that, uh, you know, uh, that there was a, 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 an initiative I saw from some of the um, Canadian trade offices in different uh, uh, European territories that were really going after expanding uh, fisheries export uh, to Europe. So I, I, I'm happy to hear that some of that has already come to fruition. Um, with our uh, um, third question, I'd like to direct first to uh, Mr. Bert Mueller. Uh, a new team took office at the end of 2019 in Brussels with a strong green footprint. Uh, in Canada, Prime Minister Trudeau's government is also looking at ways to ensure a green recovery. In what ways can CETA play a role in Europe's green transition? Um, thank you very much. If you allow me to very briefly come back uh, to the previous question. Um, I find it very interesting that the, the British Columbia brewery must be on the list of, of everybody when it comes to good examples of taking up uh, the advantages of CETA. Uh, I very much liked uh, the example of your minister because if as a Canadian brewery you make it into the markets of uh, Germany, Austria, and uh, Switzerland, uh, then you really made it. And it also shows that we shouldn't be shy about, I won't have any chance to penetrate these markets. Uh, will, will the Germans ever drink Canadian beer? We have reverse examples. We have a uh, an excellent example of a small company from Slovenia, which exports skis to Canada. So one could also ask, will a European company ever have a chance to export skis to Canada? Uh, um, but it works. Yeah, I mean, if uh, uh, tastes evolve, uh, people are interested, are curious about it. And it shows that even in parts where people think, I never have a chance, well, they have a chance. Um, but uh, that was just a uh, a little aside, so all the best for BC breweries. Um, uh, the question on, on the green, uh, the green side of trading. Now for us, it's extremely interesting that basically with a distance of one week, we had uh, President von der Leyen's uh, State of the Union address, and we'll have now the speech from the throne uh, here in Ottawa. I mean, it is, it is very seldom in political life that you that you get two major policy speeches uh, by two uh, good friends and partners within such a short time and we'll be able to compare and we'll be able to see uh, how much our policy priorities, especially uh, on the green side and on the digital side will align and I'm pretty sure they will, they will align um, pretty much. Uh, President von der Leyen has made clear that the Green Deal is Europe's growth strategy. So whenever I get the question, but how are you going to grow despite the Green Deal? Uh, I always say, no, it's, it's the other way around. It's, it's the Green Deal that is going to make us grow by uh, making us advancing on, on green uh, technology by, by seeing ahead, by knowing uh, where, uh, where the market is, uh, is going and uh, not only what is good from a, from a policy point of view, but also what is good from a business point of view, because we will all move in that direction and Europeans very often have a head start in this area because we decided very early to go down uh, the green road. And I think with two committed countries, if I may refer to the EU for, for this um, example as a, as a country, uh, as committed 
to green policy, to greening the economy, uh, to mainstreaming green policy in all other fields of um, of policy, we have a lot of potential. And uh, and and CETA is certainly one uh, one tool there because uh, we certainly have all the the green tech products where we want to where we want to increase. Uh, uh, trade between us, uh, green services, where we want to increase trade between us. And uh, we see companies on both sides of the Atlantic, which are willing to uh, to take up the challenge and to see the advantages that uh, that CETA provides. And, um, and, and once again, to, to show that CETA is is a trade agreement, but is it has enabled many other contacts. And Chris mentioned it before. For example, our our research uh, cooperation. The the EU has some of the biggest research uh, programs that are out in this world. Currently, Horizon 2020, soon Horizon EU, and Canadian scientists are great participants in this. And uh, join european scientists to work together on the latest uh, on the latest uh, green product so in the end uh, that creates a lot of uh, win-win uh, situation for both sides it is it is challenging for both sides to develop those products so just take as an example the car industry i mean uh, these uh, standards uh, for the car industry get tougher uh, every year, um, but industry uh, on both sides of the Atlantic rises to the uh, rises to the challenge, and I think we are we are in a good way. I mean, Canada is um, is a top research player. Um, we are a top research player. The more we unite on this, and uh, I think there's a lot of the basic research um, which we can do together. There's always the question at a certain point when it comes to commercial application, okay, we will also be uh, competitors, but there's a lot of things that uh, that we uh, that we can do uh, together, and I just see there's a there's a pop up video of a of a gentleman who did a research project in the Netherlands. Very good, very good. Uh, those are the things uh, we want to encourage. Uh, thank you. Oh, wonderful. Um, um, Mr. Kuder, would you have any words to say on the, on the same subject? Of green energy? Well, other than totally endorsing what Chris Dana said, um, you know, there used to be a, a character on a children's program called Sesame Street. I don't know if you ever heard of that. American program. He was a frog and he used to say it's, it's difficult to be green. Um, it's hard to be green. He used to say. Well, it's still hard to be green, but it's getting easier. And um, if you're going to be green and being green between the EU and Canada is probably about the best place in the world these days to be green. Um, fortunately, uh, with CETA itself, we've actually got a framework that anticipated uh, the emphasis that we're now seeing on sustainable development. We have a chapter on trade and sustainable uh, development. Uh, we adopted recommendations on it in 2018 and so on. And a lot of the architecture uh, actually relates to our environment. So we have under CETA, excuse me, committees on climate, energy, fisheries, forestry, raw materials, wide participation from a whole range of, of uh, elements in the EU and uh, on the Canadian side. It's complemented by the Strategic Partnership Agreement, which has another, uh, more on the political side, another set of arrangements. So it's um, also flexible enough to let us work on the emerging priorities uh, that are relevant to the green transition. So AI, uh, smart farming, uh, biodiversity. So we've got the machinery there to allow us to work together very closely on the green transition, which is becoming um, more central. And again, COVID has not slowed this down, if anything, it's um, accelerated it, even though we haven't been able to have our in-person uh, meetings. I'd mention also as well that um, above the, the CETA architecture, we've had a number of Prime Minister and uh, President von der Leyen calls over the last little while, as well as ministerial um, discussions in, in which the green transition is a, has been a major feature. So um, all of that uh, sets the frame. 
Um, the other thing that we're doing together, and this is helped by CETA, is working in multilateral fora on uh, those issues that are going to be critical to the green transition. So while not strictly speaking part of CETA, what I've seen, you know, even in the last few days, is senior officials or ministers come together, we talk about a position, and then we start to uh, at least informally coordinate on how we're going to go ahead with that. And so COP26, uh, coming out of Paris, which was postponed, as you know, from 2020 to, to next year, um, you know, we've started talking about that. We have something with the European Union uh, and China, actually, very <coughs> interestingly, called the Ministerial on Climate Action, and that uh, was hosted uh, back in July. We're working together on the Biodiversity uh, Convention, also postponed until uh, next year. And this has a, both a, a climate change and environmental dimension, but it's also important, I think, for both our, for both our societies um, to agree internationally on rules that don't unfairly discriminate against our companies who may be green and then find that they're um, put, uh, put at some kind of a disadvantage. I think as well, I've only been in this job for about a year, but over the last year, I've actually seen quite a bit of policy alignment. We were pretty aligned before, but we're even more aligned now. And uh, maybe we'll see even more with the SFT, the speech from the throne this week. But uh, the government, when we elected, the Trudeau government, when we elected last year, um, went moved to adopt uh, 2050 as a net zero greenhouse uh, uh, gas emissions by 2050. So converging with the, with the EU, we've got ambitions on biodiversity, which are similar to yours, 25% uh, protection for land and green areas by 2025, we're aiming for 30% by 2030. We too, like uh, the European Union, will be planting a whole lot of trees, about two, 10 billion more, or 2 billion rather, over the next 10 years. And um, another priority of the EU, the world, uh, the circular economy. Well, we'll be hosting the World Circular Economy uh, Forum in 2021. Like Europe, we have a lot of public support for it. I would say the fact that the west coast of the United States is burning has uh, certainly uh, enhanced that support in Canada. And that helps, I think, with this overall framework that we're talking about. And I mentioned a few things where we can work together specifically uh, under CETA. Um, you know, we want to portray Canada, uh, and we should, as a reliable uh, source of natural resources that would be key to the green transition. Things that you might not think about, like bitumen, which we uh, have from our oil resources, well, that's going to be essential for the far fiber of um, lightweight carbon fiber electric vehicles. We are in the top five uh, of countries who produce materials, for minerals rather, for batteries. I said earlier, we have 14 of the 19 minerals that you need to produce uh, solar panels. So I think I mixed that up with batteries, but in any event. Um, we produce more renewable energy than anyone except China. And that's an opportunity for the European Union to use that energy to propel forward its plans on hydrogen. Um, so we are also a leader in green building. Uh, the renovation uh, to achieve the transition was mentioned by President von der Leyen in her speech last week. We've got a lot of expertise in that area. And on clean tech generally, uh, we are ranked as number four in the world, and we have 12 of the top 100 clean tech companies in the world. So uh, I think this is an area where, yes, in some cases, we will actually be competitors. In others, we may be partners, and partners in the sense of, let's say, two SMEs going on to conquer the world against Chinese or American or other competition. In other cases, we'll be selling to each other, but this is going to be a growth sector, unquestionably, uh, and I think uh, this is a, an area that, uh, if we're talking to Canadian business, we would certainly encourage them to look into as a as a path towards the EU. Thank you very much both for, for, for this uh, insight. Indeed, the uh, green trans transition was already a, a priority, but we can obviously see that uh, with COVID and all the recovery programs, it has become much more of a priority. And, and it's good to see that uh, CETA can actually be a tool to participate in, 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 this, uh, in this growth of green transition. So now, um, Christian, if we look at uh, Europe, so Europe is a market of over 400 and 450 million consumers, 21 million SMEs across 27 countries. It might sound scary, but actually it's also a huge opportunity. So what would be your advice to Canadian companies who are considering to enter the European market? Okay, thank you. Well, I think uh, the, the first piece of advice would be 
don't be afraid of the European Union, don't be afraid of the 27 member states. Um, well, the, the great thing about the European Union is our single market. And the single market means the same rules, the same regulations, the same standards across all the 27 countries of the European Union. So basically, once you know against which standard you have to uh, produce your product, then you are good to go for all the, the 27 countries. So you can really use the scale of this market and market your product to 450 million people without having to wonder about, do I have to uh, design it slightly differently uh, for this country or for that country? No, you don't. Um, so the single market makes the European Union such an attractive partner for all, for all our trading partners because we have those 450 million customers on offer and uh, and once your product is in, it circulates freely within uh, those uh, 27 uh, million uh, consumers. Um, then there, there's often, I hear the argument, but the languages. I mean, these people in Europe, they speak Finnish and Latvian and Greek. And how can we ever master that? Um, well. Most Europeans um, also speak a second or a third language. And in nearly all cases, that second language is English. And very often, that third language uh, will be French. So as, as, a, as a bilingual country, uh, you have great advantages not only in the several countries where English, like Ireland or Malta is the native tongue or French spoken in France, Belgium, Luxembourg, um, but also in all the other countries because you will always find um, business partners who very easily speak English and very often also um, French. So that is so first piece of advice, don't be afraid it's much easier than uh, than you think. Uh, the second piece of advice would be to start small. I mean, don't think I have to now immediately set up sales points in all the 27 uh, uh, member states. I mean, try to find a member state where you think, well, that would be a good a good basis. And let's first see what I can do <clears throat> in that market and how I can use that market as a, as a trampoline uh, for the rest of the, of the European Union. So that also helps you to keep your, to keep your risk um, down. And third piece of advice is, I mean, uh, give us feedback. Tell us if things don't work out as you... As you think, I mean, we have an excellent trade team here in the in the EU delegation in Ottawa, a very dedicated uh, team. Uh, I mean, many of you might know Delphine, Maud, Marta, Lia, Luigi. Um, yes, they are always there for you. Uh, you can always give them a call, write them an email and say, uh, and I mean, we we are not afraid of criticism. Yeah? So you can tell us, you told us I could get into the market, and but it's not at all true. I mean, write it to us, write it to us. We are going to take this, um, uh, we are going to, to take this further. So um, that would be my pieces of advice. Let's see. Um, Ambassador, would you have any any, any uh, comments on the same topic? Or maybe advice for? <laughs> yeah, if I if just maybe a couple of points. Um, I, I violently agree with Christiane about uh, seeking seeking feedback. Um, I don't think uh, we could be in better and more regular touch with the private sector. Um, I find sometimes they're a little shy about saying things. I mean, I, we're not we're not thin-skinned. Tell us what you think of what we're doing. What needs to be done? 
Um, really, uh, the agreement is primarily to benefit the private sector, so we really do need and rely on what they're telling us. So that's very important. Um, and a lot of times, the kind of questions that we get relate to lack of information. I mean, how do we access uh, this particular sector in the EU? What's the regulatory regime and so on? And we can provide that kind of information. And in fact, one of the things that uh, to do a better job of that, that we are, are trying to construct in the mission in Brussels is to make the mission in Brussels more of a one-stop uh, shop, not that we'd replace uh, what our embassies do and our trade commissioners do in the member state capitals, but um, for our businesses who are sometimes coming to us and saying, I, I thought we had this agreement with the European Union, so you tell me all about how I do business across the European Union. And we have to say, well, that's not really what we're set up to do here. We deal with uh, the European Union institutions, the regulatory framework, but we're not really in, in that business of giving you detailed country specific information. Uh, so we have to find a, a way of going forward that allows our companies to enter and apply themselves to the entire market, still drawing on Rome or Madrid or Berlin and so on. But we're thinking about how we can help business in, in that regard at the moment. Um, one of the, uh, the elements that I think Christian referred to is the, the hub idea. Uh, Brussels itself is actually quite a good hub. It's uh, certainly easy to operate because of the, uh, the languages, English and French in particular. Um, it's a very national city. It's well connected. It's geographically uh, well situated and there are others in Europe. So finding that hub starting small and uh, with the more familiar languages might be a way of a good way of entry. But again, I come back to the e-commerce point that we've seen uh, grow so much uh, during, the, during the pandemic. Um, one of the things I think we would want to encourage businesses to do is not just to think about the EU as the EU, but as we ask your companies to do, to think about coming to Canada as a platform for going elsewhere. So we have access through the successor to NAFTA, CANUSMA, uh, through the Trans-Pacific, and so on to hundreds, I guess, hundreds of millions of consumers, now billions of consumers. Uh, similar thing applies looking at Europe. You have new trade agreements uh, and you have a central role geographically that, uh, that Canada does not have. Um, and increasingly, I think for businesses, if they're going to go uh, through e-commerce means, the incremental cost is not that much more of having, let's say, a partner in Europe and then going global uh, compared to what it would have been before. They're not necessarily going to have to build bricks and mortar. They may find a, a valuable partner whom they can trade with in Europe, in the EU, and beyond. So uh, I think that's a compelling argument for Canadian businesses in some sectors to think, uh, to make them think, um, you know, to, to overcome the argument that, well, it's a long way away, it's a lot of effort, and if I'm only getting a 10% increase in what I'm doing, I'm not sure it's worth it for the risk. Today, with e-commerce, and we are working on making that e-commerce work better in the WTO, and I'm sure we'll do it in the EU as well. Uh, today, the risk level is somewhat lower, but also the opportunities are greater. But it, Canada and the EU, uh, the companies in the EU are so similar, they have a, a um, you know, a similar world view, it might be easier to work with a company in the EU than let's say uh, in another region, the Americas or, or Asia. So I think there's new incentives in the way that commerce is developing that might uh, induce more Canadian business to get uh, engaged. But it's not just for us to tell them what to do, uh, we have to help. And one other mm -hmm. element I wanted to mention in that regard was one of our uh, drivers in our uh, trade promotion policy is to make uh, more Canadian businesses uh, active. So for example, uh, we've done a lot of work in trying to get women entrepreneurs introduced to the EU market. We had a, uh, the first tour of a large group uh, of Francophone uh, female entrepreneurs last fall. Um, we'd like to see Indigenous business become more engaged. We've had, actually we began the first Arctic dialogue a few weeks ago. Uh, that was obviously a topic uh, of discussion. But if we have more Canadian businesses engaged in going abroad, then it stands to reason that they should be looking at uh, the European Union and their CETA. So that's going to be another plank, I think, as we, as we go forward. And, um, and we've got a job to do there. Um, taking into account, you know, the COVID crisis, uh, um, bringing questions around economic security and uh, 
strategic autonomy, closing vulnerabilities and supply chains. Is, um, you know, Canada and EU working together on a path to recovery? Is there, a, you know, a platform that should be mutually uh, uh, drawn up, or uh, do we work on this uh, separately and come together on that, uh, Mr. Cooper? Uh, in, in moving forward uh, in the recovery period? Well, I can, I can tell you that on our side, there's a, you're probably a little farther down the road than we are, frankly. Um, the, the pandemic hit you harder first, uh, and we're a little behind on that uh, compared to where you are. So, but there's a great deal of interest on our side, I would say at the political and the officials level in um, your, uh, the way you're going forward with the experiments. So I'm, I'm thinking here, uh, not just of trade, but of the macroeconomic framework, the kind of things you're doing to shore up employment and income, what you're doing on health. Um, we're following that very closely. And CETA, the architecture of CETA does help there because we do have all of these different dialogues. Now, curiously, we don't have one on health, although that was actually foreseen in the, in the agreement itself. And so we're actively working to see, let's maybe put one of those together so we can talk about health in a broad sense. So there's everything there from procurement of vaccines to cooperation on supply chains, on personal protective equipment and so on. Um, but in any case, we're learning a lot from you and um, you know, that will probably go on for some time. So that's one, one dimension of how we cooperate on uh, recovery. Um, I think one of the things that we, we have to think about um, is uh, this debate that's emerging in Europe and to some extent in Canada around strategic autonomy. So we saw the trends already uh, starting to, uh, uh, to become visible before COVID of people becoming more protectionist. Uh, some acceleration in COVID, particularly around the health sector, personal protective equipment, supply chains, that kind of thing. Um, I think uh, now former Trade Commissioner Hogan uh, said something very um, wise uh, that uh, you know no one can be entirely self-sufficient even if they wanted to and why would you want to be entirely self-sufficient but in the case of Europe fuller advantage should be taken of the trade agreements that Europe already has and obviously that would include CETA. So I think as we come out of uh, COVID and into the recovery these questions are going to be live questions. Do we need more strategic autonomy? Um, in certain areas, probably we are going to look for um, more resilience, um, less dependence on one source of supply, that kind of thing. And that's where I think Canada can be a great partner for the EU, because as I said, uh, it's a very diverse economy. It may not appear to be uh, that for those who aren't so familiar with our economy, but we do have uh, just about everything you could think of, uh, from healthcare to natural resources to energy and so on. So if we're looking at the health sector, we have a huge pharma sector, take one example. We've done some retooling around the production of PPE even in Canada. But I think that's something that we should be discussing. Uh, if we're going to talk about strategic sectors where we need to be a bit more resilient, the logical partnership is between Canada, uh, the US perhaps, we'll see what happens in the election, but certainly Canada and, and Europe. Um, so the CETA effect, yeah, I mentioned that earlier, is also one that we need to think about coming out into the recovery. Um, the CETA effect seems to be that this gigantic market uh, that we now have access to through CETA uh, has, uh, and the fact that we have complementary uh, goods and services, uh, the business connections and supply arrangements that have uh, emerged since CETA have shown resilience. So I think coming into the recovery, uh, it makes sense that people will be looking to the European Union because it is an island of stability, as I would say we are to you, uh, in a time which is probably going to be fairly uncertain for, for some while. Um, if we looked at the uh, next three, six, eight months, and we hope we get vaccines and some protection against the pandemic in that time, but uh, I think that uh, we can cooperate on the recovery in all the fields that uh, President von der Leyen uh, laid out in her speech last week. We've talked about the green transition, lots of areas there for um, Canadian business. Uh, we've talked about the health sector and resilience there, the digital transition, absolutely, um, including things like countering, on the more political side, countering disinformation with the EU, which does have an effect on commerce as well. So that's an area that we're working uh, with the EU on. 
I mentioned closer work in the multilateral sphere, WTO, especially on things like e-commerce, uh, G7 on AI, uh, the OECD, uh, and in the G20, which uh, has its summit later this year. Um, that's something that in terms of recovering from COVID, closer cooperation in all of those multilateral four is going to be very important. Um, I think we will need to have an updated information campaign. We talked a little bit about how our companies need to be better aware of what we're doing. Uh, I would think about uh, something like the um, GI protection that we offer uh, to European business in Canada. Um, actually, it's pretty easy to get that protection in Canada. It's a very straightforward process, but uh, we did an outreach campaign to inform EU business about that. So the things, basic things like that will help us knit together trade because that's obviously what we really need in the, in the follow, uh, follow through from COVID. We do, I have to say, need to fully implement CETA as well. Um, there are, of course, ratification is one aspect that relates primarily to the investment chapter. As for the rest of it, what we'd like to see is implementation of the conformity assessment, um, uh, which is still outstanding. We'd like to see recognition of uh, professional credentials. This will greatly facilitate lowering the cost and greatly facilitate uh, business between uh, the EU and Canada. And finally, um, again, to come back to the dialogues, we're learning from each other um, in all sorts of fields, taking best practice, if we can streamline and adopt best practices in this gigantic and terrible, in some ways, experiment that COVID represents, if we can learn from that about how we can bet, get better prepared for another pandemic, how we can insulate business from that, uh, and then I think we really will be putting our business and our societies on a better footing um, coming out of this uh, COVID pandemic, and we'll be stronger for it. Uh, well, good, good. Good comments. Uh, Mr. Bertz Miller, would you have any uh, words to say on working together on a path to recovery? Christian? Can you, can you hear me? Christian, can you hear us? Ah. Okay. I think Christian we can hear us. might have a technical issue. Oh, yeah. Christian, Christian can you hear us? Yes, I mean on on COVID. I mean, if there if there's one thing that that made uh, the COVID crisis clear to all to us was the very high degree of interdependence between our our. Yes, yes, yes. I can hear you. Yes, yes. We can. I can hear you. Yes. 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 You yeah. you cannot hear me. No, I can, yeah, we can, we, I can hear you. Yeah, yeah. Good, good. I can hear you. I, you can hear me now? Yes. 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 One thing we are having transatlantic yeah. uh, connection issues. Can you hear me or yes, can't yes, you hear yes. me? I, I can hear you very well. Yes, I we can, can hear you. you. We can hear you now. Yeah. I think there's a delay. Okay. 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 Then I then I continue. Okay. Yes. Okay. Excellent. Okay. Okay. Um, yes. I think. It, okay. Uh, so the COVID crisis has all shown us the the high degree of interdependencies between our economies. How much we depend from each other. How much we source from each other. And, uh, and also has uh, shown to us that on, on some areas uh, that can constitute a, a real problem. And I think we all during the COVID crisis experience, especially on medical goods, personal protective equipment, that suddenly shipments were not arriving, were redirected, uh, others got them first. Uh, so that leads then immediately if you want to to see it from a positive side uh if you now rethink your supply chains i mean with which partners would you rather do it would you not rather do it with stable rules-based uh, democracies who uh, where where you have legal rights uh where your your claims are recognized in the courts 
So I think uh, Canada and the EU are ideally suited to be these partners where we are both well-functioning uh, states of law. And uh, uh, so I, I see a lot of new opportunities uh, uh, when we consider sourcing from the outside certain goods that uh, Canadians might rather look at the EU and the EU might rather look at Canada when it comes to to importing crucial supplies as as Chris has very well said we will never be self sufficient for everything um but when we will be uh depending on on others for the more sensitive uh goods we will certainly look closer on where we uh, uh source them from and i also would like to say a word on on the concept of strategic autonomy which chris mentioned so we in in europe have now given it the the title of open strategic autonomy, so to make clear that while in certain areas, especially medical supplies, might also be some, some food products, we want to be more autonomous, that we still remain the traditional open traders that we always were, and that's sort of that it doesn't mean protectionism, it just means that on certain very crucial uh, health products we want to um, we want to become more autonomous therefore we use that term open strategic autonomy and uh, at the end of the year we will come out with a new communication on EU trade uh, policy sort of already directed at the the post covid world and uh, we currently do a public consultation on this so if you go online um, you can, uh, whether as an individual business or as a business federation uh, or any other stakeholder, you can make your voice heard and you can also use that um, to voice any grievances you have about uh, CETA. Um, implementation of CETA is certainly uh, key. I mean, both sides... Uh, have their have their uh, grievances. I mean, Chris mentioned uh, conformity assessments. Uh, we still have issues on some of our um, agricultural products like cheese and wine, but we are working through these and the and the infrastructure in terms of uh, of uh, um, meetings is there that we can go uh, through these issues and. I just wanted to say CETA has served us well so far. It has been a good, it has been a good trampoline for more, for more trade between us, but we can certainly use it more. And as the good partners we are to each other, I rather see a bright future uh, for our trade relationship, especially in the post-COVID world. Great. Thank, Thank you to... To both of you, indeed, I think it's a, it's a balance between autonomy and, and, and trade, of course, we, after this uh, COVID situation. But again, it's, it's in, indeed important to remind that um, CETA is really a stable agreement between two stable zones, I mean, Canada and the EU. So it's, it's indeed very interesting to, that we can work together on, on this uh, recovery. Um, I think we, we touch base uh, quite many subjects right now. Um, we already have a lot of uh, questions, so of course questions will also uh, broaden the, 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 the discussion. But uh, for now, I would like to invite uh, Nathalie Béchamp for her, um, her, her presentation on, on Canada. Um, so she's the Chief of Investor Services at Invest in Canada and before joining Invest in Canada she held diplomatical assignments with Global Affairs Canada in Moscow, New York, uh, Santiago and Bangkok. So we'll have a yeah, 10 minute presentation and then we'll be with a question and, and answer. Excellent, thank you so much. Thanks to UCAN, to Stephen Delphine. Um, wonderful, wonderful discussion on how CETA has really bolstered the trade relationship in both directions. And of course, you know, we always like to talk about how investment follows trade. And certainly that is true. 
we've heard about the overarching figures uh, in both directions, 300 billion of investment since, um, you know, since the, the introduction of CETA really is significant and shows a strong commitment. Now, I will respect the time you've kindly given me. I will uh, take you through some slides. Here we are. And just bear with me a moment. I will dive into this. Uh, Delphine, I'm trying to connect back to um, Zoom so I can share my screen. Okay, no problem. Don't worry. If, if you need, I have the presentation if it's... Uh, just bear with me a moment. I'm, I'm in the presentation. Then you have the sh yeah the share screen button yeah here we are yeah here we are. and excellent great okay. can see. yes so I will just uh, we'll just get into it then um so invest in Canada is the national investment promotion agency for Canada we've been in existence now since March two thousand eighteen. Um, really, in essence, you know, why Canada decided to launch this, um, this new agency was, was certainly not to duplicate uh, the efforts that many partners across the country and abroad through our trade commissioner service currently offer to, to global companies, but really to bring them all together. We know uh, we've talked about the EU and the myriad um, you know, countries and languages and the complexity that may be perceived, there certainly is a bit of complexity uh, in navigating the Canadian business landscape. And so the whole purpose for us is to connect the dots, uh, essentially between federal departments, provinces, territories, cities across the country because we also uh, you know very much recognize that investment comes into specific communities specific cities and certainly our, our big big partner in all of this is the trade commissioner service uh, we work very closely with canadian missions abroad we also have a very modest presence across canada so i show these these regional offices to you from uh, the west coast in vancouver through Calgary, um, in the Prairies in Regina, Toronto, Montreal, and Halifax. Um, really the promotion, facilitation, acceleration that we do is, you know, really does encapsulate all of these different partners that you see on the right hand side of this slide. These are all the different groups, both in Canada and abroad, that spend the better part of their days promoting and attracting investment. And we at Invest in Canada have very good working relationships with each and every one of these groups. Um, and internally, we also have systems. We're developing an approach where our systems and our CRA can communicate so that we can stay in touch on all the most important business transactions. In terms of the companies that we work with, and there's a, there's a good number of um, European firms that I will get to in a moment, um, you know, because our mandate is really quite narrow, but deep as it relates to providing assistance to global companies, we, we truly um, try to act as a high level advisory service. So we build on the work that trade commissioners can do in market in terms of uh, presenting Canada perhaps for the first time, presenting the key advantages. And then we can also supplement that with very customized and bespoke proposals per company. Uh, we share market intelligence, we share labor information, programs and policies that are relevant uh, to the company, but not, not specifically for one area. It can be, it can be a regional focus, it can, um, be a sector focus. Also through our vast network of, uh, of good contacts, we can make um, introductions. We're very well poised at any level of government across the country, um, as well as with key stakeholders in, in academia, with universe, within the university framework, 
Um, we also have new super clusters that have taken shape roughly around the same time that Invest in Canada was created. The government of Canada also launched five super cluster initiatives across the country. And they, they are just now building up their strength and prove, uh, you know, as, as uh, both ambassadors were speaking and, you know, as the conversation was going around, um, COVID recovery, economic recovery, I think investment will play quite a, an important role. The figures, of course, um, you know, support the story that's happening around global trade, um, COVID having very um, sort of a, a negative impact globally certainly also affects the investment figures. UNCTAD is predicting that globally FDI will be down between 30 and 40 percent as a result of COVID. Notwithstanding that, um, early research is showing us that with the nearshoring of key industries, including in life sciences, agri-food, and advanced manufacturing, um, in addition to that very healthy suite of trade agreements, we spoke of those very briefly, but Canada has 14 different trade agreements in effect. Of course, for the purposes of this meeting, uh, the CETA is the one that we'd like to focus on most predominantly, but for any company that chooses to uh, establish itself in Canada, you should know that you will have access to 1.5 billion consumers um, Canada is the only country in the G7 that has free trade agreements in effect with the other six countries. And so there really is there, you know, as, as Ambassador Cooter was saying, there is that, um, that vast uh, platform to work from if you're doing business in Canada. I won't spend much time on this because I know we spoke of it, but if you just look at that, um, the first uh, graph on bilateral trade, and if you just look at the, at the shadow box since CETA has been implemented, we do see that both, you know, as, as also as um, uh, Christiane was saying, uh, both exports and imports have increased in that time frame. But if you also look at the, at the right hand uh, side, the box is showing the key sectors where Canada has received investment from the EU. And so we are, um, you know, very well poised in areas such as technology, clean energy, communications, and, uh, and some of these others. Really, at the moment, Canada is enjoying uh, quite uh, quite great success in the area of innovation and technology. We are receiving investments. In fact, if you look at the at the investment figures. Though they are down in Q2, they're still at $10 billion just for the, the second quarter of 2020. But over the last few years, we've seen um, a very steady flow migration from US technology firms coming to Canada. And they're coming to Canada because we have the talent. We have engineers, individuals who are uh, well-trained, who are intelligent, who are creative, and in addition to that, we have the immigration facilitation through our immigration department. We have the global uh, talent program, the global skills program, which um, normally, you know, I, I will say it, but, but I will also have a bit of a caveat. It, um, it has enjoyed a 10 day turnaround time for work permit applications in very strategic sectors and certainly in the innovation uh, space, companies looking to bring their engineers either, you know, through intra-company transfers or to bring, you know, bring them in um, outside of their own company's network, for the most part can expect a 10-day turnaround, which is, is really quite unique, unsurpassed by most, most countries. And certainly what we're also seeing uh, in the US, which also, you know, traditionally has enjoyed a, a high concentration of tech firms, um, their reliance on foreign engineers has, uh, has really been um, uh, discouraged because of the restrictions around H-1B visa renewals. So there is, there is a trend um, at the moment that we are seeing where not only American tech firms, but global tech firms that have a presence 
in the United States that may have their regional headquarters in the US are uh, very interested in moving uh, apart or their entire operations to Canada. We've seen that with Amazon, we've seen it with Amazon Web Services, we've seen it with, with a host of other companies as well. And there's still space uh, to grow in the tech sector, so not to, to be concerned that we've reached our capacity. We've touched a bit on the life sciences piece, so I don't want to, um, to belabor that point, but to show you some very recent examples of European firms that have chosen to invest in Canada, Sanofi, through um, a new vaccine facility in Toronto, has announced over $500 million in terms of an investment and its ongoing commitment to Canada. As well, German company Bayer has also announced uh, in 2016 its investment of just under $300 million in Toronto in the area of therapeutics. In terms of agri-food, I know we've touched on this earlier in the conversation, you know, there, there really is a, a great expectation that in terms of uh, what Canada can offer and in terms of a recovery from COVID, we really can continue to grow in this space. Recently, French uh, company Raquette has confirmed that um, they will be expanding uh, in the province of Manitoba a P fractionation facility valued at $400 million. And so this is a wonderful example of, um, you know, in Canada, we, we certainly have uh, big cities. You've seen in one of the earlier slides, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get through all of this content, but I, I, I think you may have noted in an earlier slide, we have um, on a North American scale, some of the best cities in terms of um, an innovation platform. We also have uh, the space in rural and remote parts of the country. And so the Roquette investment is an example of um, a great investment in the, the prairie region of the country and one that will act perhaps as an anchor for other opportunities to follow. We spoke briefly um, earlier about hydrogen. Um, I, will, I will use this opportunity simply to underscore that the Canadian government is committed to developing a comprehensive hydrogen strategy. I know this is of great interest to European colleagues and, and corporations. And we also have seen, you know, whether it's the automotive sector looking to develop hydrogen fuel cells for heavy uh, vehicles, whether it's in the liquefied gas um, sector, companies such as Air Liquide from France, also looking to do more in Canada and the Austrian company AVL, uh, looking at Vancouver to, uh, to tap into the local electrochemical cluster that's, uh, that's present and growing there. In terms of our talent base, these are wonderful indicators. Um, so, you know, we, they, they speak for themselves, uh, but really the, the, the point I'd like to leave you with is that not only do we have the talent that's available in Canada. And we, we do hear from global corporations on a regular basis, even in these COVID times, um, that every corporation is hunting for talent. Every corporation is looking for the best talent. And so what you will find in Canada is a healthy um, base of well-qualified, well-educated talent, as well as the ability to bring in um, the talent that may not be present to bring in specialized workers and, uh, and, and experts. And certainly it also speaks to the strength and quality of our education system and, uh, and the, the relatively low costs of university. I've touched on some of these programs, but these are enablers at the federal level. And I'm conscious of the time um, so perhaps I, I will just uh, leave it here just to quickly say the global skill strategy is the immigration facilitation program I mentioned earlier. There are many opportunities um, to support innovation, whether it's through our research and development um, tax incentive program, tax credit program, the SHRED. There's also within the supercluster, 
formation. There is um, there are the five superclusters really have a, a huge emphasis, place an emphasis on innovation. There's also the crossover to the Strategic Innovation Fund with over $2 billion. Now the fund isn't um, exclusively dedicated to global companies. It's open to both Canadian and international firms who are looking to do large scale projects in Canada, but where also there is um, a focus on innovation, on, on growing certain sectors of the economy and acting as catalysts. In, uh, in certain ecosystems. And then certainly the cost of doing business is always uh, very much top of mind. Uh, the federal government trying to find ways to, to bring down the costs, to bring in new forms of incense, incentive. There's the Accelerated Capital Cost Allowance Program that's been in effect now for close to two years, which really is, um, is quite beneficial to any manufacturer allowing you to um, to write off your capital costs for machinery in the first year of business. I will stop respecting the time uh, that Finn kindly allocated, but I'll leave you with these names. These are colleagues of mine at Invest in Canada. Mr. Dan Velichkov, who is our senior advisor for the EU. He has a few, um, he, he will be very pleased to assist with any inquiries and also Madame Seika Sarazai, who uh, as well is one of our service advisors for the EU, and uh, Seika tends to work mostly with uh, French speaking countries. So I will pause there and thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Nathalie. Well, actually, I, I, will, I will take the opportunity of your light slide because we have some few questions around um, support that Canadian companies can have to go to Europe or EU companies could have to come to, to Canada. So maybe uh, maybe we'll start with, uh, the, with Chris and then maybe uh, Christian will give you the floor also on, on that. So um, we have a lot of advice that we can give you through our Trade Commissioner Service, uh, based of course in Ottawa and uh, in the mission in uh, Brussels as well. Um, so I think that's quite easily accessible online, but we're happy to naturally follow up with any specific detailed information. Um, but it uh, depends on the, on the area of the sector. Our missions in the member states of the European Union also can provide more sector-specific information or country-specific information as well. We do have some missions that specialize, like Berlin, in one sector. For example, it deals with clean tech. And so that can also be um, uh, a bit more of a guide for the whole of the European Union, but um, uh, it's quite readily available, but don't be shy about asking because we can certainly provide uh, all, of that, all of that information. Christian? Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Yeah, certainly while we here in the, in the EU delegation in, in Ottawa can certainly be your, your first stop of contract uh, for every, every question related to EU rules, EU regulations, uh, it would certainly also make sense once you have identified the EU member states where you would like to get started, uh, to also go to uh, that member state's embassy here in, in Ottawa, uh, because in the, in the internal division of labor uh, we have between the EU and its member states, trade promotion, so everything that is about helping individual companies to conquer new market is the competence of our member states. So uh, it always makes a, a sense to check both uh, both sides, us at the EU, more on the regulatory, on, on the legal framework side, and then uh, with the respective embassy of the member states for the more practical uh, information. Um, I have a question for Natalie, but I also want to mention at, at, at this point that um, also, of course, you can, we, we are here to, to assist, um, not to assist, but we are here for the company, so we can also direct you to, to other um, institution that might help you whether you want to enter the Canadian market or the EU market. So also feel free to 
to, of course, con contact us. Um, Natalie, we have a question. Uh, to, do you have an uh, internationally based office uh, location in, in the EU or is it just in, in Canada for now? Uh, yes, so we are exclusively in Canada, but we work hand in glove with the Trade Commissioner Service. So as uh, Ambassador Cooter was saying, certainly any investment inquiry anywhere in the EU should be directed to any one of our Canadian missions, any embassy or consulate, and they will know um, how to refer them back in through us. We work together on those. Okay, thank you. Um, so, could you uh, maybe, Christian, give us a little bit an, an overview on, because there was a question on, on ratification um, within the, the, the EU. So, can, can you give us like an overview of wh where we are now in terms of ratification of CETA? So, yes, of, of the, the 27 uh, member states of the European Union, so far half have, um, have ratified CETA. That might not uh, seem much to you. Uh, however, the average ratification time of a trade agreement in the EU is about five years. So for us, this is not very surprising. For many national parliaments, that is not like a, um, like their, their most pressing uh, priority uh, to go about uh, to go about ratification ratifying international treaties. So, for example, uh, South Korea it took it took five years. Uh, the question also why this is uh, by many member states not seen as the most urgent thing is because. Uh, except for the investment chapter or parts of the investment chapter, all of CETA is provisionally applicable. Uh, so I also think uh, that the national parliaments don't get a lot of pressure from business now to absolutely make that a priority because CETA to the largest extent is already applicable right now. And then there are also a couple, very few parliament where um, this is tricky uh, to get this ratified. And so they are just waiting for the right, uh, for the right moment uh, to put that uh, to, a, to a parliamentary uh, vote. Okay, thank you. We, we, we talked a lot about uh, trade today, but uh, we have a question around government procurement. So um, I'm just making a note on that. You can organize a, a webinar on, on how can Canadian and European uh, companies can take advantage of uh, government procurement. And the webinar is actually online um, on, on you can YouTube channel. But um, we have a question, so, so the person is interesting to know if it actually has grown over the last three years during why, since the CETA is implemented, if we've seen government procurement increase in Canada and in the EU. Maybe Chris? Yeah, I think I don't have the, the figures on that specifically, but my impression is that it's a bit disappointing. It's one of those areas that we really need to inform Canadian business a bit more about because the procurement market, which covers all levels in the EU is, is huge. Uh, but I don't think uh, you know, the uptake has been um, what we would hope for. It's still a document or an agreement that's in its infancy. As Christiana said, it's, it's really quite early days in a sense, but um, it's one of, the, one of the fields we would like to you know, be able to tell our businesses why don't you try this? Because this is a very, very large market. Yeah, if you allow me to, to say, I, I, I completely agree with, uh, with, with Chris. I mean, it, it could be better. It could be better. I think on the, on, on the EU side, we have a pretty well organized database for all the big, for all the big tenders going on in, in Europe. And uh, if I'm not completely mistaken, all of these tenders have to be published in English too. So um, we think that it is a pretty sort of accessible way. But I admit, I think that that, that is true for both sides. Uh, participating in a big tendering process uh, in a 
different jurisdiction is uh, often a bit intimidating. But there are examples of uh, of small um, of small. I I I remember that uh, Commissioner Malmström and Minister Carr at the time uh, they were and they uh, they visited a, a bicycle company here in. Uh, uh, in, in Canada, I think it was in, in, in Montreal, which had captured um, the, the rent a bike market in Spain. Uh, there, were, there were several Spanish cities that sourced their rental bikes uh, from Canada. So, and, and that was not a gigantic company. Yeah? So it is possible, it might just be that they have that one uh man or woman in their company who said i'm going to to conquer uh the eu tendering process and um but for that company it worked yeah. yes indeed uh, I, again as i was saying of course government procurement just as chris and christian said I, is maybe not the first thing we we can think about when we think of uh, of cita but it do it does exist um, and so you can, in partnership with Mila Thompson, we came up with a fully guide on, on how you can, you can take projects uh, around the government procurement. And I think Global Affairs also have a very practical guide. And again, the webinar we organized um, with Global Affairs and Mila Thompson really gave tips on, on how to navigate with the, with the government uh, procurement. Um, I have another question regarding tariffs, going back on, on, on trade that uh, were already quite low before CETA. Do you think trade has increased because of the removal of tariff barriers or because CETA has highlighted the Canadian markets? Uh, Chris or Christian? Well, I would say both. Um, I mean, we have found uh, historically that trade agreements are, even with small countries, um, there's typically a bounce in trade right after the agreement. And we, we think that's due simply to that issues in the newspapers all the time. People hear about it. Maybe they hadn't thought of that country before or that region. Uh, but definitely, I think the, the link is pretty clear with the, uh, the drop of now 98% in the number of tariff lines, because we can see that those products that were subject to a tariff before have had the biggest increase in terms of their export into the EU. And it's not a small amount. It's a very large amount. So I think Clearly, uh, tariff reduction is has made a big difference for a lot of different companies. Yes, I um, I fully agree, and I think even even if the tariff is only three, four, or five percent, it's still it's still a nuisance, and uh, it makes that just thing so much easier if you have a zero tariff. Great, thank you very much. Um, I, I, I would like to be mindful of um, of, of time. Um, I, I, of course, we, we didn't really have time to to answer all the questions, but um, so I, I will just uh, give you two information. So first of all, um, I'm, I'm still taking the question. Please feel free to send us an email at uh, info at youcan.com. Uh, if your question has not been answered, we will take it and then uh, we'll, we'll get back to you by, by email. And also, I wanted to touch base on you can next agenda. We, because it's also, as you can see on the logo up there, it's also our 25th anniversary of, um, of action between EU and Canada. So we are, we are coming up with a, a, a program that will run from actually next week to uh, beginning of December, it's our series of webinar called One Week, One Province, and you will get the opportunity to, to review all the trade and investment opportunity actually with each Canadian province. So we will work with the provincial governments and they, will, they are experts in European uh, trade and FDI, so we, they will give you all the tips you need to know to come and invest or trade with, uh, with Canada. So I've just sent the, the, the link in the chat box, so feel free to register. It's again one week, uh, one province. And uh, yes, on, on that note, I really, uh, before I give the final words uh, to Stephen, I really wanted to thank all of our speakers today. Uh, it was really interesting to, to see how CETA is really a stable agreement and how we can actually continue to, to grow together. And, um, and for, the, for the participants, thank you for, for being here. And again, you can register to UCAN's next uh, event. Over to you, Stephen, for the for the final words. 
Oh, you are muted. It's Jan. Yeah. I'm, am I okay? okay? No, no, it's fine now. Oh. Yeah. Yes, uh, thank you, Delphine. I would like to thank uh, Christian Bertmuller, Christopher Kuder, uh, Marie Ng, and Natalie Deschamps today for their insightful words. And, um, you know, we're looking forward to uh, not just recovery, but progress. Uh, I echo um, Delphine's words and, and encourage you to, to take advantage of our uh, One Week, One Province series. Uh, we're, we're starting with Alberta next week on the 30th of September. Um, and that will run for, uh, uh, for, for 10 weeks. Um, um, in a nutshell, uh, you know, I, I, I know the last quarter of 2020 uh, is, you know, inundated with words of uh, second wave. Uh, um, I'd like to, you know, all of us look at this as maybe a, a character building period and uh, we look at it as a second wave of, of, of uh, progress and recovery as well. Uh, thank you all of you today for attending and uh, I look forward to seeing most of you or some of you in person in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much everyone and have a great um, day or great evening depending on where you are calling from. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everyone. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. bye.